I am Valentin Fuster uh, from New York. I am the director of the Mount Sinai Heart Center at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. And I'm editor in chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. It is a pleasure for me today to chair this important webinar about a subject that we all talk about it, but we are not doing a good job. And this is global burden of disease, of cardiovascular disease. So here's the question, where we are today with the subject and where we are going. So I have with me four real experts in different aspects of the cardiovascular field that I would like to introduce at this point. First is Professor Marco Balgimigli. Uh, interestingly, uh, he's deputy chief of cardiology at the Cardio Centro Tosino Institute in Lugano, Switzerland, but is actually originally Italian. He's professor of medicine at the Faculty of Biomedical Sciences at the University del Suizera Italiana in Lugano, Switzerland, as I mentioned. And he is very well known by his work on structural interventions of the heart. And he has a very great interest on antithrombotic agents. He has a fantastic bibliography with an H index of 102. And it's a pleasure to have you here with us today, Marco. Thank you very much, Professor Fuster. Thank My you. Pleasure. Then we have Pablo Perel. Pablo Perel is, is, is now in the World Heart Federation uh, there in Geneva. And I said, Pablo, send me, said to me a few words. And I said, this, this, he's Argentinian. And he says, obviously, now he has another one. Here we have an Argentinian living in, in, in Switzerland, in Geneva, a very well recognized epidemiologist, actually. Uh, he worked for some time with my friends, actually, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he's editor of the Global Heart, Heart Journal, and he's doing a great job with the World Heart Federation, uh, reaching studies at Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so forth. Welcome to be with us uh, today, Pablo. Thank you, Dr. Fuster. My pleasure. Then we have uh, Dr. Christian Meyer. Uh, he's Professor Meyer is an associate editor of Jack Clinical Electrophysiology and managing editor for the Archives of Medical Science. He's director of the Clinic for Cardiology at the EVK Dusseldorf, the University of Dusseldorf. And uh, very well recognized electrophysiologist. You are German in German, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, it's that simple, but thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. At least you, you fit with your birth <laughs> country of origin. And here uh, we have finally a, a very good person, a good friend, Dr. Marianne Brodman. Uh, Dr. Marianne Brodman is the head of the division of Angiology and head of the clinical research at Division of Angiology at the Medical University of Graz in, in Austria. She's past president of the Austrian Society of Angiology, and she's a technically a very savvy person in terms of endovascular technologies and certainly in peripheral vascular disease, and with a particular interest in anticoagulation and in thrombolysis. You are Austrian, isn't it, Marianne? I'm an Austrian in Austria. <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, it's a pleasure to have four of you here to have a um, very um, open discussion about the realities today, and that is where we are with this global burden of cardiovascular disease and where we are going. Well, about 10 years ago, I became very frustrated because I was seeing that although mortality in cardiovascular disease was decreasing in some countries, was actually increasing in others. And when you, were, and when you went to the countries, a high economy countries in which the disease was decreasing, now today we cannot say the same. We are really reaching a plateau in terms of cardiovascular incidence and in terms of cardiovascular mortality. And it opens to my, to my thinking 
of remembering somebody saying by 220, cardiovascular disease will be eradicated. And in fact, we are seeing the opposite. So I would like to ask Pablo, what is your perception of the present situation? Because it's really frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, it is frustrating, um, particularly because I think in cardiovascular uh, medicine, cardiovascular disease, we've been very successful in, and, and you, Dr. Fuster, and many of the clinical researchers here, you've been very successful in understanding the causes and finding treatments for cardiovascular disease. But we've been very slow in um, implementing those interventions. So I think, although there has been, uh, in general, um, a decrease when you look at age-adjusted mortality, uh, there are many regions in the world that we haven't seen that decrease. And as you said, some regions that there is a plateau. And the main uh, driver of this is the lack of implementation of the things that we know. So that's kind of very frustrating. And that's where I think it's a, the really pending agenda for the cardiovascular community. Marco, I'm going to give you an example. Well, you're an interventionist, of course, and, and uh, you're doing the job that you're supposed to do. But let's go back to the global burden of cardiovascular disease 219 that we published in JAK a year ago. And here we have the usual risk factors. And just to focus our attention, let's say we have at this moment, we had seven, then eight, nine. What risk factors we are talking about? Well, two mechanical, let's call it for the purpose of understanding, high blood pressure and obesity. Two are chemical, high cholesterol, LDL and, and uh, sugar, diabetes. And then I would say three, the, three are more behavioral, tobacco, lack of exercise, and a poor diet. And then more recently, it has been added uh, lack of sleep or poor sleep. And even more recently, which I don't know why it took so long, uh, renal disease. Well, having said this, let's just take the number one factor today of all that we mentioned that came in the global burden, which is hypertension. I am an editor of the journal, Jack, and here I have constantly, article after article, about whether the blood pressure should be 120 or 119 systolic, and the diastolic should be whatever, 80, and article after article, debate after debate. And then I look at the realities, 50% of the people who have hypertension, they don't know it. And they, well, those who know it, 50% are not properly treated. So why we are so obsessed in dealing with theoretical concepts rather than the reality that we are missing what is in front of us? Uh, th this is a great comment, Professor Furster, and of course, I can only echo your remarks. In reality, we are looking at the tip of the iceberg. We are looking to those in whom the diagnosis is made and those in whom perhaps there is already some degree of control of the risk factor, namely uh, diastolic and systolic hypertension. I think the, the data that you are mentioning, the fact that uh, the majority of patients with the disease are not even aware of having the disease, and if they are aware, they don't perceive that as a disease, is where we should put our energy and focus on. Uh, for example, if you think about how people are Perceiving the condition, perhaps often they go one uh, every time to the doctor, they ask to have one blood pressure measured. And then so, no, yes, it's high because I simply am a little bit nervous today. I, I think the way we are diagnosing the disease is probably an old fashioned approach. I think we should think a bit out of the box and make this measurement more widely and readily available at the population level. First, inviting them to more frequent check. And second, perhaps keep exploring more sophisticated approaches for the diagnosis, which would make that information available in front of us on a daily basis. So if you do not know that you suffer from the disease, you cannot escape that information. And if you have the disease already diagnosed and treated, at least you know if and how much that condition is under control. Yeah, but even Mark, when you go to guidelines, you should start reading. They begin with numbers. There is not an introduction in saying, we don't know what we are doing. <laughs> and and no, but this correct. is the reality. And I think it's very, very frustrating but uh, I'd like to, to continue now with Marianne. And Marianne, I was running a study, 
uh, called the Freedom Trial. This is a study of diabetic patients who had multivessel coronary artery disease. And the question was bypass surgery versus stenting. Well, we got the results and I, I got excited because it was an answer. Bypass surgery appeared to be superior to stenting in patients with diabetes and bad coronary artery disease. And I was frankly quite happy. But let me tell you what happened to me about six months later after the study was published. I decided to look at how these people were treated medically. And I went over the control group, or well, no control, excuse me, stenting group versus the cabbage group. And you know what I found is published. Only 25% of the people were taking the medicines they were supposed to. And here I was quite happy six months before saying, we have the answer to diabetes. And I know you deal with, in general, macrovascular disease, not only in the coronary arteries, Marianne, but when in fact we found that even the treatment of hypertension, of LDL cholesterol, even the issue of obesity was completely passed. And I became so frustrated too in saying, we are really trying to use technology again and again, which I, I don't know, I'm not against it, by the way, but I think we are, you are really forgetting one of the key issues today, which is lack of adherence to medications. And I like your comment. Um, the only the only thing I could say is this is the same uh, was in the peripheral space. We we try to evaluate and invent new technologies, try to use fancy things, long procedures, and we are not focusing on that. What really is the most important thing? We cannot keep our vessels open if we do not try to. Um, educate the patients that they should really stick to their medication, that it's not only opening vessels, it's not only doing a bypass surgery or whatever. We need to do the not so fancy thing. And this is keeping the people on the medication, keeping our patients on the medications and try to take care of the risk factors. And, and also how to say, create awareness of that. It's so important to create awareness that this is the underlying cause of the disease. It's a reality, is indeed, but how it's little attention. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me tell you, Christian, what happened to me, and, and I don't want to personalize this, but I think an examples that, that really change your way of thinking. 15 years ago, when I was actually running also the trials of freedom and other trials, and I found that people did, did not take the medications, I said to myself, maybe the problem is too complicated to take three or four medicines if I have coronary disease. Let's simplify with a polypill. Well, this is 15 years ago. I went to the companies in the United States and I said, you know, could you help me in a polypill? It's a very fantastic idea, but we are not interested. And the reason was because they were with HIV situation in which they use a polypill and was very expensive manufacture some of the companies in the United States. So anyway, I was able to get a company to make a polypill. And I didn't forget about the polypill. And the study was just published in the New England Journal just a week ago, two weeks ago, which is the polypill following myocardial infarction. And now here comes the question. I had a webinar yesterday, all devoted to the study, with lots of people on the line. And somebody says, you know, this is too simple. Today we have to be personalized medicine. And I say, I didn't say it, but I thought you are stupid. How can you talk about personalized medicine when in fact only 25% of people take the medications that they are supposed to take? Are we going to make a super ACE inhibitor that only one person may be able to take it? So I'd like to at least that you go on now uh, um, addressing the question that I think we are very obsessed by individualized medicine, which I don't I look in cancer has been fantastic. But in cardiovascular disease, I think we are very far from doing what our job description should be. And yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, in, in general, I, I would I would agree in that way that, that the simpler 
we have to approach the better in some way because it, it will increase the likelihood that the given patient will be adherent to his medication. Um, on, on the other hand, I think it's one challenge. The, the poly pill, you, you mentioned this, it took 15 years. And in the meantime, while we're getting more evidence for the poly pill on the one hand side, the medication for specific patient populations, if we think about ischemic heart disease or other, other situations, the medication is changing in the meantime. Um, so I think this is, this is an important challenge between evidence and, and rapidly changing um, optimal medication. Of course, we need to, to, to get the basic homework done, make the patient to, uh, to be adherent to his medication. But on the other hand, we have to implement new evidence into new polypills. The very basically, what you are saying is absolutely correct. And that is, there is a, you cannot exclude individualized medicine with the new SGLT2 coming in. Uh, you cannot exclude global medicine being simplistic with the possibility of the polypill or something else. And we are, we are not going to exclude, now we all should be primary prevention, no secondary prevention. Well, but this leads to an issue that I think is very, to me, is, is critical that we discuss this op openly today. All of us, I think the five of us that are in the screen, have been working very hard in understanding disease in one way or another, all of us in different ways. But was actually 10 years ago, as I mentioned, that after having official kind of responsibilities with good institutions, the American Heart Association, the World Heart Federation, uh, as you, uh, Pablo, are today in Geneva, I reached a conclusion that we were not in the right direction. Let me tell you exactly what I meant. We all tell about disease and tell about disease and tell about this. Sure, all the guidelines start at age 40 and you look at heart attacks and strokes. Nobody knows what goes on before or who cares. Even the guidelines, they don't even mention what to do except treat risk factors. So uh, here I go back to you, Pablo. You don't think that we have missed the boat for a number of years and rather than getting earlier and earlier with new technologies that we will be discussing in a moment, we just have been involved in the diabetic complications and the stroke problems and the hypertension hemorrhage versus stroke. All of these things have been really part of our lives, but I think we have been missing how to prevent all of that. We, the talkers are full in the world, lots of talkers. They just get into a, a, a panel of people and they say what should be done, but no action. I'd like to know your opinion as an epidemiologist really being very much in the middle of the field and in the crossroads between secondary prevention, primary prevention or primordial prevention. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I cannot agree more uh, with you, Dr. Fuster, the kind of frustration and the, <clears throat> um, how we, I mean, the, the two examples you gave in terms of personalized uh, versus the population health approach, and also discussing small difference in values for hypertension, why we are missing the more upstream determinants and, and, and life approach to conditions. For me, it was really what changed. You mentioned at the beginning, I work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine that is very strong on public health. And I'm a cardiologist by training and I was focused on patients and diseases, but that view, and that's for me part of, um, we've been very good. And, I, and again, I, I think unique in the field of medicine in terms of uh, understanding causes and new treatments. But also now we need to work with other uh, specialities, public health, and understanding what are the so kind of social determinants of health and also how we need to start early, early on in uh, managing the context and environment. And that's something we need to collaborate with other specialities. And I agree, uh, particularly a, a strong focus, and I know you've been working on this as well on, on on children, on childhood, on, on, on risk factors uh, at the household level, not just at the patient that is coming with a disease when he's 40 or over. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Well, I'd like to begin to dissect this now. 
and going to address different ages because I think one of the main problems is sure you should quit the smoking whether you're talking to a 16 year old or you're talking to a 70 year old and so forth and I like uh, uh, I, I like to start uh, by talking to Christian uh, Christian you, you you obviously you're an electrophysiologist I think you guys are doing very well by the way in terms of quality of life and a number of arrhythmias you know ablations and and so forth, and sudden death. Uh, but let me tell you a patient that I encounter, and then you encounter very often. The patient comes with cardiac disease, and you keep saying, you didn't lose weight. You still smoke half a pack a day. You still that. And the, this patient tells you, doctor, to hell. You're making my life miserable. And frankly, I rather prefer to die suddenly than just the way you want me to live. Well, you probably know about the new information that is evolving with new technology. Now I want to emphasize how important technology is, despite of a subject we are discussing today that say maybe we went too far to, towards technology. I don't think so. The two technological ways to address uh, disease, so clinical disease, you know, one of them is 3D ultrasound. And, and, you know, it turned out that we started 10 years ago a study, the PESA study, looking at the two carotid arteries, the iliofemoral arteries, the aorta. And then you look at calcification indirectly about coronary artery disease. And, you know, we started 10 years ago. Uh, and let me tell you the first two findings. One is published and the other is going to be published in the next few weeks. But I think it's important. When we talk about LDL cholesterol, we say, well, if you didn't have a heart attack, no stroke, a healthy life, 100 milligrams DL is okay. This has been actually in the guidelines. Well, I can tell you the following, and this is what we just published. If you look at subclinical disease, unless you have an LDL cholesterol of less than 60, you have disease there. And we control for all the other risk factors. Tell me about hemoglobin A1C. We look at 5.7 to 6.5. And you say, you know, pre-diabetes is an alarm system for diabetes. Well, it's not an alarm system for diabetes. There's already a lot of subclinical disease. We found the same thing with triglycerides. So what I'm really trying to address here is that it is very important that we begin to rely on new technology that really looks at who's developing the disease rather than saying who might develop the disease, which is the risk factor. And I'd like to know your opinion about that. Yes, strong point for sure. And uh, I can mostly only agree. Definitely, we have to, we have to, to learn early in life health uh, supporting behavior. And we have to uh, do some kind of um, screening or however you would call it quite early. To define the right population in whom to screen quite early, it's it's a rather more difficult detail. But of course, we have a lot of programs, I think, in Europe, especially in Germany, where uh, they focus, of course, on prevention. And especially ultrasound has become quite important in recent years. And I, I think it's for, for us, it's standard, standard and I think it's that holds true for, for most uh, sites in, in Europe. Um, when is the right point to begin? That's the more challenging part. Of course, we know um, the more LDL we get exposed to throughout the lifetime, the higher is the risk in which patient or, or which person uh, to screen at the, at the given point of time, even before 40 is the more challenging part. But of course, definitely ultrasound is of increasing importance and it's uh, used much, much more than some years ago, definitely. Let me ask Marco. You, you enter these arteries constantly and you see a lot of disease. Do you know of the 4,000 people that we are following for 20 years and the age of 50 males, how many do you think have subclinical disease by ultrasound in one of the regions I mentioned? Which would be, would it be your bet, Mark? Would be probably a, more than 50%. You are right, 75%. Yeah. And women is 50%. So I don't have a question anymore when you should start because this is under age of 50 and I will tell you about children in a moment. 
and, wow. and, 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 and so we have already the disease in front of us. And actually, it, it, uh, every four years, we follow these people in this progression of the disease. So I think we are dealing with subclinical disease that nobody pays attention because what people pay attention are heart attacks and strokes. And this is where the guidelines are all based. But let me tell you the second issue we found, and this is what is going to be published. You know what happened between age 20 and 40, and that is, you say, well, you know, borderline this, borderline that, and well, you go to the cardiac study that you know well. We went into the data of the cardiac study that they started to look at age 20 and they followed patients for 60 years. And what we did is very simple, is a graph. In the abscissa, you have the follow-up. And in the ordinate, you have LDL, hemoglobin A1C, and how they impact. When you look at the area of the impact between age 20 and 40, we now have the data. We, we can predict much better eventual events than when you start over age of 40 with all these risk factor profile formulas. So what I'm saying is, not only we are considering normal LDL or hemoglobin A1C, when in fact it's abnormal if you look at subclinical disease, but we are missing the game on people at earlier age. And I just would like to convey this because it's important that uh, reading guideline after guideline and coming to the journal that I am the editor and I see all these guidelines, I think, are we in a primitive stage? Are we really looking at technology that is available today? Maybe we should open the questions. So this is what I am asking you. No, this is a very difficult uh, point. Of course, I cannot agree more with you. Uh, from a practical perspective, I'm going to raise a question, not give an answer. Uh, the question is, who is going to pay for this? Who is going to pay for the screening? And every time you set up a study to understand whether a screening is or is not cost effective to have an argument to sell to the payers, uh, in the majority of cases, the cost effectiveness is really at the edge. So from a scientific standpoint, I cannot agree more with you. Uh, but unfortunately, we need to be realizing that we are in a way, in a condition in which the market is deciding what we do more than what we should be doing. And so uh, uh, who is going to pay for these uh, kilograms of statins given to these uh, young people? We need to have evidence. We need to generate evidence. We need to get uh, start working outside our building and see uh, what is happening outside the hospitals. If you look at where the resources are invested, 90% are within the hospital, perhaps less than 10% outside, whereas most likely should be the opposite if we can do right. the job that you are describing and hoping for, meaning preventing this very uh, dreadful complication to happen by acting as early as possible. Well, we were discussing hypertension before, and if, if you are only based on uh, cuff-based uh, technology to make that diagnosis, if you don't make that information available on a daily basis, on an hour basis, we will not care where we want to be. You cannot just simply reply on a pharmacist measuring the pressure and getting some money for this exercise. You cannot rely on a doctor making that assessment once a year. It's not, it's not working. It's the data that you are referring to are extremely clear and sound. We need to think outside the box and start investing more in technology that are making what we are dreaming for possible. Yeah, I think you are correct. But let me follow with Marianne now. Uh, an expert in peripheral vascular disease, and I'm sure has seen a lot of diabetics. Do you know, Marianne, the, the device that we use, 3D ultrasound, will be completely automatized next year, in a year or two, actually, in which you will see this, the number of cubic millimeters of disease, whether it's in the legs or in the carotids, etc. What we are doing in countries now that they cannot afford, we are putting the device in the femoral region, right? because this is the disease where it begins. In fact, it's very interesting. One of the surprises to us is that actually the subclinical disease, the first region it is affected in 75 to 80% of people is the iliofemoral region. The thing, the arteries are very large and they do not cause any symptoms. So that's why patients present with coronary disease and otherwise. So it's a very systemic disease, but I can tell you in terms of cost, which uh, completely in agreement uh, with uh, what Mark was talking about, 
Still, we can really get a lot of information from studies that will provide us with information that will make us to move at a low cost. And we are going to start a trial, the pre-cut study, patients, individuals between 20 and 40 with LDL cholesterol more than 70. And they're going to be randomized and followed by ultrasound. Expensive is going to be, but that's where we should go back. And it's what you said, I think, Marco, and that is we have to really go back to trials. We have to go to younger people and so forth. But I like your response, Marianne, about the disease that is systemic. And still we have tools that are reasonably simple to address it. Um, yeah, Dr. Fusta, with regard to this systemic disease, um, we see it, um, as you have seen or uh, mentioned, especially in the younger ones um, who are patients with diabetes or have bad cholesterol levels, that we see this so-called asymptomatic disease uh, with ultrasound in the arteries, carotids, or uh, uh, iliac femoral arteries. Um, and we see it in the young people, the young people which, who are smoking. But the, I think the most important point will be before what we are discussing right, right now, to get a, a screening tool uh, who, is, um, uh, who is in danger to develop that. Uh, and who is progressing in the, the way uh, we want to avoid. I think we really need to start at, we need, we need to get evidence when to start screening the patient and what is a, a patient group or, or what is a human being group, which is at risk of developing that because some people do not develop it. Uh, even if they have the bad behaviors like smoking or whatever. Uh, so we need to detect this and then we can focus on them. I think that is the most important thing with all we want to, we want to achieve. We can treat the, uh, the disease afterwards and just you know try to minimize the harm, but we need to find out whom we need to protect. This is my, my opinion. You don't think that uh, one of the problems here, technologically speaking, is not a problem. Look, the risk factor development has been a fascinating story, one of the most important in medicine. But to have disease and seeing it versus talking about the risk factor is quite different. And what we are, and, and I think what I try to emphasize is something you mentioned now that we have to screen to see if the disease is there, aside of the risk factors, though. Because if the disease is there, I don't think you can have a worse risk factor. I, I agree with you. I agree with you that we need to see the disease. But, we you know, as um, uh, uh, Marco and, uh, uh, and also Bablo already have mentioned, it might be expensive, you know. We are here in the Western European world, but, you know, Western European or Europe is not so... How to say homogenized? We have people in other countries here where they don't, where they're not able to afford, you know, this. Where the economic situation is not as good. So, so I think we really need to, and we really need to uh, come to a level where we have um, a point um, where we can distinguish between people at risk and not at risk. I think that should be the focus of our, of our, yeah science well let me uh, let me ask pablo pablo we are now working in in some uh, areas in africa okay specifically in kenya and one of the issues that uh, is becoming critical is how can we identify the people who are actually at risk and here's the story you go to the iliofemoral region with the device i mentioned very very cheap you don't think you have to train individuals and then we don't take a blood sample. We actually, we rely is on the risk factors I mentioned, but not on blood sugar or cholesterol because it's all mixed with obesity and all of that. So I, I'm just trying to, not to counteract what Marianne is saying, that things are expensive, but I'm trying to say, maybe we constantly talk about things are expensive, when in fact there are ways to do things that are not expensive and provide a lot of information. And this is a new approach we are taking actually in countries that, with low economy. No blood taking, just takes 10 minutes about the risk factor profile, and you just put the device in the iliofemoral region. 
I just like to comment about it. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I completely agree. And actually, I'm doing a, a study uh, also in Kenya and in the Gambia, where we're looking at a similar approach, uh, Dr. Fuster. What we are trying to do is to validate uh, some measurement of target organ damage with a, a, a smartphone uh, to stratify uh, in terms of risk uh, people with hypertension so we can start uh, treatment and, and, and kind of combination therapy and so on, a polypill approach. Uh, the reality is that uh, risk scores are not validated for Africa and, and we will not have data right. uh, for, for many decades. So if we can measure non-invasively, and this, um, we are also trying to use artificial intelligence uh, uh, with the ECG um, and, and, and so on. So I completely agree. I also agree that, of course, the challenge, I mean, just to give you an example, I think you are uh, suggesting a, a change in paradigm starting early on when we don't have a, a kind of a clinical disease and it, it makes sense but just to know where we are if we took if we take statins for example who recommends giving statin at those that have more than 20 percent of a cardiovascular event in the 10 years so it's i mean kind of high threshold yeah. and and it's mainly driven by age as you know but even that it's only fulfilled in one in 10 in lower middle income countries. So only one in 10 for primary prevention that fulfill that criteria are receiving one study. And I'm not talking about reaching yeah. the, tar the target LDL because they don't have that data. So we are so far away, even to give statins at very high risk that a change in paradigm, as you are suggesting, I think it's clearly needed from a scientific point of view, but will uh, require, uh, I mean, we'll have a lot of challenges. And I think technology definitely can be useful but uh, we need to think sometimes, and, and I'll finish uh, with this, is technology. And you said we, are, we have new technology and we, and, and we think it's interesting. And, and in a way, we get a technology and then we, we think what problem can it solve? And it needs to be the other way around. We need to start with a problem and then how technology can help us. And I think Absolutely. in this case, uh, it, it could be, but that's a challenge we, we have ahead. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. And we go back to... Uh... <laughs> To Christian. Christian, remember the patient I presented to you that said, you know, I prefer to die that you give me so much help in decreasing weight and the stopping me smoking. I prefer to die suddenly. Well, you know, the new technology of imaging, and now we are moving, we have been talking to people between age 20 and 60 practically, the, all this discussion. In the elderly population, what the technology is beginning to show is very striking. And that is that if you look at MRI flow of the brain or PET scanning with glucose uptake and cognitive function in people who are hypertensive and were not treated properly, hypercholesterolemic and diabetes, these are the three groups that we have information and so others. We are beginning to see that in fact, the risk factors that we are talking about are really the key of cognitive dysfunction in the future or senile dementia and even acceleration of Alzheimer's. So what I'm saying from a practical point of view, you don't think that we should begin to become brain doctors and not just cardiac doctors, because people, society, at least in the experience I have, is much more sensitized to cognitive dysfunction than to sudden death. And you are in the sudden death business. But I just like to present this to you because the, now I find that the people, when you talk about you might not recognize your family or your loved person and so forth. They really react much more vigorously to change in lifestyle than if we keep talking about the heart. I totally agree. Absolutely. I think this is really a, a key point where we can, um, can help the patient to, to, to really adopt to lifestyle interventions and, and uh, keep staying with their medication, definitely. And also coming to atrial fibrillation, stroke is just the tip of the iceberg. And we're beginning to learn uh, how, how much uh, hypertension, of course, a major risk factor for AF, AF itself, how these um, aspects are key determinants of, of cognitive decline. And uh, even to change a lifestyle after the diagnosis of AF, like quitting to smoke, that, that, that this might have an impact. There are some initial observational data on this, that this can have a significant impact of, on, um, on, 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 on brain function. 
I think this is, this is really one very important uh, point to, 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 for patient education, for patient education and to make him change his lifestyle. I totally agree. Yeah, well, thank you very much because these things are in front of us. I mean, you don't need high technology here. Yeah. What you need is, is just read the literature of what is evolving. Yeah. And that's it. Now, I'd like to move now in, uh, into children and then into the real life of prevention. Now, uh, children, we have been very involved with children just by chance. I, I, I became part of Sesame Street kind of, uh, of, of educational program. And, uh, and the first thing we did actually was to change Cookie Monster and decreasing, uh, not eating cookies seven days a week, but just one day a week. And this had an impact on children that changed completely the philosophy of uh, sesame. Sesame is now really very much on disease in developing countries and so forth. And it's not the educational program of our children, <laughs> my own children, I remember, they were watching with. Well, what happened here is at the same time, and I'm talking about, two, uh, about five years ago, six years ago, it became clear, uh, biologically speaking, the children uh, between age three or six or seven have a smaller number of centers in the brain than later on in life. And therefore, whatever you tell a child is a store, is much more succinct, is not, is not a, a battle of messages with many centers being involved. So we took that and, and we began a, a, a program and I just want to go back to the issue of how difficult, but we should never quit. I went to the New York City Board of Directors of the Educational and I presented that I wanted to do a study in children in New York, a very aggressive study, I will tell you in a moment, in which we'll be at this age infusing the importance of health thinking that when they were older, this would come back as something they learned at a younger age. Well, this was refused. Uh, it was no way I could go anywhere, except I had been working with President Clinton when I was president of the AHA, and he said, you know what, you should go to Central America. And they're very passionate and well-organized. So <laughs> I went to Colombia, and we, between Colombia and, and then uh, a few institutions in Spain. And eventually they accepted our data in, in, by, in uh, United States and Harlem, New York. We pulled 5,000 children, randomized 2,500 into controls, follow up between age three to seven. And the other children, 60 hours of teaching over six months, uh, how the body works, the issue of diet, the issue of physical activity, most interesting, how to control the emotions, teaching them to say no, when in later age they are presented with alcohol and so forth. Good and bad news. The results were very good, frankly, the, 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 when you compare the control, and it's all published. And actually, this was the reason why we are really in the United States, because all of this is published in a randomized fashion. Uh, but let me tell you the bad news. And the bad news is this lasts for a while. And that is when these kids reach age 10 or 12, we found that they forgot great part of what we told them. However, if you now you teach them again for the second time, the results are exponential. So what we are learning, and we are now dealing with 50,000 children, all randomized, is the issue of sustainability. And the issue of sustainability is such that in five studies that we are involved with the adults, we found the same thing. Whether you do group therapy, which is much cheaper than individual therapy, in an adult between age 20 and 60, the results may be very good, but much more expensive, an individualized approach. But still, you have the issue of sustainability. After two or three years, you have to go back because obesity came back, smoking came back. So we have the issue of sustainability as a number one. But there's a second issue. Fascinating. When these kids went home and told parents what to do, eat together a meal, exercise, no smoking, they had an impact on the family. And we began to see the importance of the environment that has into everything we do every day, rather than saying you go individually. And now we develop a program, which is a family program, 
in which we do the same that I presented to you, the four type of tools uh, of 60 hours. We do this in the parents, children and grandchildren with a different focus at home. We started this few months ago and you don't have any idea the success in industry. People in industry with people who are working there then the workers can actually enter studies on health promoted by the executives of the industry has actually a very significant impact. But this leads to something that I would like to emphasize and know certainly your opinion. I believe that prevention is very difficult, very difficult. Uh, sustainability is a reality of our li lives and our flaws children or no children, but it's vital the environment that we live. And this leads to the question that to me is critical in prevention. First, we have to go to the school systems because we are seeing the results now. And we look at sustainability when we do examination again, intervention again. But I think we should go from the bottom to the top and leads this to my critical question. We are always blaming the politicians. And that is, they are not doing this, they are not doing that. But my question is, are we really educating the young population, children, and then the adults in sustainability and the environment, and then go to the top? And once you have randomized the studies, then to show this to the politicians. And the only reason I'm mentioning this to you, because you, you guys have influence. And it's not that I try to influence you, but I'm saying that I'm seeing the importance of studies that are randomized when politicians read the studies and they act. I'm starting a study in New York in the five boroughs now, all favored by everybody in the New York area, when before was impossible. Why? Because we can present the data that we have obtained in Harlem and in other districts. So I like to finish by discussing prevention here, the sustainability and how we get into the environment that people, for example, the control groups do, do so well in the school system when the other children are being intervened. And we find the same in the family. And I like to really focus on this because to me it's a critical issue for the future. Well, let, let me start with uh, Pablo. We are talking about prevention and you are really very much into it. Yeah, I think, I mean, of course, uh, I do agree that it's very important and we need to focus on prevention. I think you you showed a good example uh, and, and 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 you you highlighted a main challenge that is sustainability. But I, I would like to extend that concept of sustainability beyond the kind of clinical effect of whatever is intervention, but sustainability on the system, because once you've done the study, you want that to be implemented, to be scaled up and to be sustained over time. And I think you, you touch into a very important um, issue that is how we present evidence to decision makers. And that's one item, but I think there are other things we need to consider when we work with decision makers. The first thing is to engage them from the beginning. Uh, and and they are not, many of them, they are not scientists. They don't have uh, the kind of attention that we have as data. So it's, we need some skills to engage with them. Uh, again, here, I benefit from working with people that have uh, other specialities and, and, and dedicate specific, and not many of decision makers will read a New England Journal of Medicine paper or a Lancet paper. We need to present the result in such a way that they get their attention very clearly. First, what we want them to do. And then, I mean, that's, we need to start with that. This is what needs to be done. And then I think coming back, I think one of uh, uh, Marco's comment before is, we also need to make the economic argument for that. Why it, it's not only we want you to do this, this is the evidence, and this is the economic argument. How are we gonna save money in the long term? Of course, the challenge is that for many politicians, they don't have the long-term vision because they might be in government for only four or six years. But I think that's uh, one way of engaging them. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think that those are important issues to consider. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh about economics, what we found, you know, we have five studies. Uh, three of them are individualized approach. Uh, one was just published in the European Heart Journal. And, and that is to get into people who have subclinical disease and begin to work on these people between age 20 and 60 in terms of the risk factor profile. And you are successful 
but uh, certainly is very expensive. The resources that you need are significant. On the other hand, when you go to group therapy, you put 10 people together, they meet once a month, and they try to help each other into where their problems are. This is much cheaper. So I think what we are learning about exp- about the issue of expensiveness is maybe we should get much more into community work and to much more into the kind of public or, or, or uh, this approach that I think appears to be much cheaper. But I have very little to add into uh, what you are saying. I would like to ask uh, Marco, what do you think about all of this? We are talking about prevention. Sustainability is a problem. And the fact that we are individualizing rather than going to an environment is another. So I can tell you what I'm thinking, which is sort of an outcome of this discussion, to be honest, because I did not have that idea very clear in my mind before. And but before the more we speak into this concept, the more I think you are completely right in pursuing the type of research you are pursuing. I am biased by nature because I'm an interventional cardiologist. And for me, seeing is understanding. I want to see the disease. But basically, what we are telling you is something very similar. Instead of speaking about something which is not understandable, nobody understands hypertension. You have hypertension. Yes, and so what? It's not a problem. I don't feel anything. You are not worried about LDL. I'm not diseased. It's simply high uh, cholesterol circulating. I don't see the problem with that. Once you see the effect of these on arteries, on whatever you can show, on whatever you can visualize as subclinical disease, I think the communication to the patient is much more powerful. I have plenty of patients who are knocking the door of my office asking, I have a calcium score of that amount, what should I do? If you tell them the coronary arteries are 40% obstructed, they are panicking, whereas we all know that is not necessarily predictable of something. It does not predict future outcomes as long as they stick to prevention. So I think instead of speaking about risk factors, we should start more and more to speak about subclinical disease. And we should not do the mistake of calling it subclinical disease. We should give it a very strong name so that the people are getting scared. I'm struggling even after an MI if they're having a lot of cardiovascular events in getting them on uh, LDL well control, on hypertension well control, because it's not only a discussion between me and my patient, a discussion between me, my patient, the family, the, the community, the 2,000 doctors that will be seeing that patient and will tell that patient that perhaps 165 pressure is not that bad, they can stay with that, they will stop the statin. I think you are completely right. It's not one single individual who can make that thing. It's a community approach. And at the end, as you said, you're right. We are weak because the politicians do what the public opinion pushes them to do. And if we buy in in the community, at the end, the politician will follow. They will not drive the story, but they will follow the story and support it. Okay, thanks very much for your comments. Marianne, we talk about prevention now, sustainability, and environment? Um, you know, I, I think we really need to start at a very early time point. Uh, and um, the example you brought up that we try to teach at a very young age, children, how important it is to have a good lifestyle, you know, with regard to healthy food, with regard to um, sports activity or whatever, and then train them over the years, and um, and do it over the years in a, in a in a in a repeat way that this is important. If you're able to change the people already, you know when they are growing up, they might not switch in this unhealthy thinking they are in right now, um, and uh, they might be able to fulfill and go on with it, with a healthier lifestyle and therefore also have an insight what they can prevent with that. Uh, right now, we are only talking about um, showing people what is already wrong with their body. Yeah. Then it's too late. You know, that's, that's my point. I mean, you know, this ultrasound technique, that's a very good tool. People look at it and see, oh gosh, how does my arteries look like? but it's already too late, you know? It's an already too late state 
uh, just to change things because they're used to things. And that's the point. So we need to start earlier. This is just my, 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 my comment on that. If you're able to change at an earlier uh, uh, time, if you're able to change how people are living, then we might be really um, succeeding in preventing all this. Yeah, you know, Marianne, in, yeah, in the study in Harlem, we studied 600 children. It was fascinating because we paired the study with the parents. In other words, we did intervention on both the children and the parents. And very successful when you really link both the issue of the environment. But it was something that was very troublesome. These parents were between age 22 and age 30. You know, you're dealing with children between three and, and you know what? 25% already had subclinical disease. And that is, 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 is like uh, what we talked at the very beginning. Sure, under the age of 50, you have 75%. I think Christian was almost correct. But the reality is that it starts so early that unless we pay attention, we don't pay attention earlier and earlier. I think we are missing the game here. Anyway, let, let me ask uh, Christian, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I think at this uh, point of the discussion, we're, we're also very much talking about education at the end. Yeah, it is. Um, so uh, especially if we're talking about the, the young, about the kids or the young patients and so on. So education is key. And we, we, we know so much things that might work to, to, to take prevention into action. But how it is happening and how can we can make this um, really, how we can change the situation of populations and individuals in daily practice, that's, that's a challenge. And education is the beginning, but at the end, I think considering all our concepts, I really think there's one factor that we have to take into consideration that these are psychosocial aspects, not only as risk factors, but also to modify modifiable risk factors. Because let's call it in a simple way, the monkey mind has a major impact on all our health related behavior. Um, so our individual psychosocial stressors impact uh, our, our, our um, physical activity, uh, our food intake, our smoking habits and, and much more other things. So there are a lot of things to consider in this, um, context, but I really think education on the one hand side and uh, tools to, to, to deal with the environment at the given situation can really uh, improve our way to, to prevent cardiovascular disease. You know, about uh, a few years ago, I had to give a name to a foundation that I, the foundation I'm working with. And I had five minutes to give a name to a foundation that had to deal with health. And the question is, what do you decide when you have only two, three, four, five minutes? What is important in your life? <laughs> and I will tell you what came out. <laughs> I thought, you know, science is important. I started there and, you know, this is my background. So we have an S. And then I said, health is important. So we have an H. And then... I said, in God, education, you cannot do this. So it came the word she, which was very appropriate because we have forgotten our women and in many, 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 many cardiovascular studies. So my foundation name was she, but it was elaborated in five minutes. And oh, it's the, the, the critical issues that I think are important, that, that at least to me in the subject we are actually discussing today. Um, I, I think that um, the... I was very, very happy with the discussion that we all had in the dialogue. Uh, I'm sorry if I presented personal examples because it's the only way I could attach something to be discussed. It's like you present an index, but it's not in any way. Everybody's doing great work, and I didn't want to even monopolize this as where the world should go. But I think the discussion, and particularly what we have about children, sustainability, and the issue of environment, the issue of cognitive function, all of these, I think, is something that should really get more and more into the minds of all of us as 
cardiovascular specialists and, and so forth. So I just want to finish by asking one comment from each of you that you think you would like you to convey in this webinar to people. So let's start uh, with you, Pablo. You can say it in Spanish, Argentinian, but let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's be more global today. Yeah, I think I, I, we cover so many fascinating topics, uh, Dr. Fuster, that um, it's difficult to give uh, one. Maybe I, I will come back to one of my comments that uh, I think for me it's important. We need to work uh, outside our, our uh, silos, and I think we need to work with people that know about education, behavioral change, neuroscientists, public health. We cannot solve the problem of cardiovascular disease only among us, among cardiologists. We are really good at what we do, but also we need to be humble and uh, collaborate and, and look outside our own silos to, to solve this problem. Thank you, Marco. The only thing I could add to this brilliant discussion is that since we are targeting young individuals and I have three children, I know how difficult to speak to them and to be understood from them. We have to modernize ourselves and we are boomer. We should try to move into the digital space more and more. And instead of medication, we should probably in the future more and more speak about digital therapy, how to convey messages, because sometimes a message unfortunately vehicled in a digital way because that is the only way it can be understood and uh, retained it's the most important point even more than prescribing a medication so it's time for us to modernize ourselves thank you marianne i think uh, we really need to change ourselves we need to have a different mindset in the future and as uh, uh, marco has said we need to modernize ourselves Cells. We should not um, be doctors just, you know, uh, dealing with what is already uh, not uh, curable anymore. We need to switch to prevention. We need to switch to start earlier when we can prevent uh, uh, the disease. And we also need to go away from our tools we had, we, we, are, we are used to for, for years and de decades. We need to go away from books. We need to go in a modernized uh, way of transmitting our medical advice so that we reach everybody. Thank you. Christian? Um, most of the thoughts I wanted to address already has been addressed in this wonderful discussion. Anyhow, um, first of all, we have so much evidence with respect to prevention. And I think key is really translate the given evidence into action. And for example, already more than 15 years ago, we had in Germany the idea of a prevention law. And this was really challenged by a lot of things, but maybe it's worth to come back to this somehow to translate evidence into action. Also, uh, this also holds true for daily clinical care if we're facing the individual a patient. And finally, uh, I think it's quite important at this given point of time that from a scientific perspective, we evaluate innovative lifestyle interventions addressing modifiable risk factors. Yeah, thank you. And actually, uh, I have to say in the optimistic side, uh, at least what we are experimenting in the school system is more and more schools want to get involved when at the beginning was very, very difficult and was just giving talk to schools and so forth. And today we are being asked by number of schools that want to, to participate in some of the programs and so forth, which, by the way, they, these are not expensive programs. Uh, it's a lot of volunteer young people and, and so forth. So I have a sense of optimism that something is evolving that we should take advantage in trying to foster. Well, anyway, look, uh, I really appreciate and I can only speak uh, on the name of the American College of Cardiology uh, to give thanks to you. Uh, it was very exciting, uh, all your comments. We all have to learn from each other. And uh, maybe we will talk again some of these days in saying, you know, we talked about this four or five years ago, and now this is happening. I hope this is the case. Anyway, thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank, Bye -bye. thank, you. thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.